This morning, we're talking about pleasing God. Now, I've often, often wondered if, uh, if God is pleased with us, you know. And, and uh, that's a different sermon altogether. But pleasing God. Let me ask you this. Is there anything more important than pleasing God? Think about it. Anything more important. Well, my job is. <laughs> uh, yeah, really? Uh, if it wasn't for God, would you have a job? If it wasn't for God, would you even be breathing? You, you see, we limit God, and I don't think he likes that. I don't like that. You want someone uh, to, to limit your way? Well, okay, let's, let's don't go there. Let's, let, let's stay with subject, all right? Your whole future life living in heaven or in hell depends on pleasing God and not pleasing ourselves. That's reality. We need to understand that. How many more want more power in your life? Amen. All of us do. All right? And, and, and it's not so much for ourselves, but how many want more power in your life so you can help other people? Yeah. I mean, that is the, the whole crutch of Christianity, the whole crutch of heaven. It's not about us anymore. It's about us using what God has given us to help other people. I learned this a long time ago. I used to drive a, a Lance route. I hated that job. Oh, I really do. You're selling crackers and stuff like this, you know. And, and some mornings I'd just get up and go, ah, you know. And I'm driving down the road. And I'd see some jogger jogging out there. And I would do this on purpose. I'd pull over and say, excuse me, would you like to have one of these fine, fresh cookies from Lance? And they'll look at me, and I said, for free. Just because I'm having a rotten day, I want to make your day better. That makes me feel better. They'll take it with a big smile, and guess what? It works. You can't help but feel better when you're helping somebody else. Have you experienced that? And that is what's pleasing God. You see, we were created for God's pleasure. Now, if you stop and think about that, that means he finds pleasure in talking with you, with working with you, to be around you, because he made you that way. Does that make sense? Then you got the devil says, yeah, he has pleasure tormenting you. He's a liar. What father has pleasure tormenting his kids? Not mine, not yours. I'm talking about our Heavenly Father who loves us, who has given everything he's got. And this morning, that's what we're talking about. So how do we please God? How do you please him? We really need to put that in thought and then put it into action. Amen. It starts with, it starts with F. It starts with, say it, faith. Oh, come on. Church, we really need the sermon this morning. It starts with faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's black and white, right? Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There's the formula for pleasing God. Sometimes we got to take a verse and really look at it, not just read it and go to the next one, but understand the full meaning of the verse. How can you have faith in something you don't believe in? And think about that. Do you believe in God? If you don't believe in God, you can't have faith. You must have faith. You see, faith without belief is dead. It can't work. Well, that's a duh. Well, how come we don't think about it? Well, boy, you guys are quiet this morning. All right. I guess that's good. All right. Now, if you look at this verse, this is a formula for pleasing God. Pleasing God requires faith in him, trust in him. Amen. Would you agree with that? And, and faith is something you don't see. I'll cover faith here in a minute, all right? 
Pleasing God requires you coming to him. Isn't that what it says? Anyone who comes to him. Pleasing God requires believing that he exists. Is there proof of that? Oh, we covered that over and over and over again. Pleasing God means that you understand that he rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. You see, God's reward is greater than any reward that we could give ourselves. So we should be earnestly seeking Him. Now, I'm going to bring us down to brass tacks this morning. We really need to look at this because our time is so short. All right? We're watching our financial institutions go down the tubes. You guys do know that there was a major bank that fell apart. It's happening, all right? We need to wake up and realize that our time is short. (laughs) What do you mean your time is short? I want to see people saved, don't you? I want to see people to have a relationship with God. I I want a closer relationship with God and, and, and feel his presence because I like the power that's there. What are you talking about, power? Well, without power, you're useless, and, and what power are we talking about for me to make myself better? Heavens, no. God has already made us his kids. We are wonderfully made. There's more to life than that. And I like the way God puts it. It's all about everyone else and not me. And that's what heaven's all about. And I'm going to live right now like I'm living in heaven. How about that? How about that? Can I do that? God says I can do all things through him. I can't do it on myself, but I can do all things with him. But pleasing God is the most important thing. So that, that's the formula to, to pleasing God. If pleasing God requires faith, then the next question is what is faith? And, and anytime you ask that, they always go to this one scripture. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Well, what does that mean? Think about it. Amplified puts it this way. It really puts it out. Now faith is the assurance. Catch it. And I, maybe I really need to go slow so we can get it locked into our spirit. It is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. The word hope means we expect. Hallelujah. We expect. Being the proof of things we do not see. Let that sink in for a minute. And the conviction of their reality. Faith, perceiving as real fact and what is not revealed to our senses. Now, revealed to our senses? Christ talked about that in another way. You you know this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. We live by faith. And not by sight. And I'll go a step further. We live trusting in the love that God has in us. And that love is perfect. I wish I had that kind of love toward you and you toward me. We're not there yet. We're working on it, right? But I trust in his love. And what does his love mean? He takes care of us. He meets our every needs. He, he knows that when we have troubles, how to turn it around and make it to our benefit that we can be beneficial to other people. Right? He is in absolute control, whether it's political or in your own spiritual life. The disasters that happen, does he dream those up? No. There's a devil out there that wants you dead. 
He wants you totally dead. He wants you out of the picture. And if he can't do that, he's going to neutralize you. He's going to throw problems this way and this way. And God sits back with pleasure and says, you know what? You can do that to my kids, but you're going to wish you hadn't. You know, they crucified Jesus Christ. But the statement was made in Scripture, if the devils had known what the plan was, that through this catastrophe that mankind would be saved, he said they would have never messed with God, with Christ. And I think that's true with us right now. When problems come our way, and I'm talking about from experience, God has always turned it around. It may not be the way I thought it should have been. It may not be in, in the expediency of it. But we've talked about it in the past. When trials come, our faith grows. And if you have faith in God, pure faith, that's pleasing to him. Why? Because it takes pleasure in taking care of us, his kids. Does that make sense? Okay. In simple terms, you trust him with all of your being, with all of your heart, no matter what the situation looks like. Know that God is in full control of all situations as long as you fully trust him. Now, a lot of times, even when you don't fully trust him, he goes out of his way and shows mercy, doesn't he? Because that's the nature of God, and that should be the same nature that's inside of us. We're talking about pleasing God. Now, what does that mean as long as we trust in him? What does that mean that uh, uh, we should trust him with, with everything, no matter what the situation looks like? Basically, what we're saying is this. We're acknowledging that God has got our back. Always. He's got your six. Right? Right? And he will always show you the way. Proverbs says this in 3, 5, and 6. He says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct his path. Now, if you break that down, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with a pure heart. You, you have seen children that trust mom and dad with all of their heart. There was a guy, uh, this is an old story uh, about a missionary that uh, uh, had to get a certain plant that was down on, on this cliff. And I don't remember why they had to have it, but uh, among the people that were there working with him was a small child. He was a native to the country. And he was small enough that they could put a rope on him and lower him down. They asked him if he'd do it. He said, under one condition. Watch that. Well, the guy, the little kid took off. And he came back with an old rickety man. And they said, here's the condition. If he's part of the rope holding me up. Who is the man? It was his father. You see what I'm saying? He fully trusts in one person, his father. And that's where we need to be. I fully trust with all my heart in my father because he loves me. And that pleases him. It takes a lot of trials to require genuine great faith. Would you agree with that? Is there scripture for that? Oh, yes. 1 Peter 1 and 7. I'm going to use the NLT. I really like how it puts it. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Anytime you go to a trial, you're showing not only to God, but more importantly to the people that are around you and to Satan himself that the belief and the trust you have in you is genuine. All right? It is tested as fire tests and purifies gold. You want your faith purified. That's why we go through a lot of trials. Has God ever failed you? No. no. We thought he did. But if you keep going and you find out that you were wrong. Right? right. All right. Stay with me. 
It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, although your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will, be, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Guys, I'm looking forward to that. How do we deal with marriage conflicts? How do we deal with attitudes? How do we deal with depression? How do we de deal with finances and all the troubles and the trials that we face in life? You deal with it with faith in God. Pure faith. Keep working on it. That's how we deal with it, is it not? Because if you're dealing with it with the psychology of this world, good night. There's a lot of loony people running around. The psychologists say that there's nothing wrong with them. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that alone. All right, but you understand what I'm talking about it. All things are possible to him that believe. We know that from Mark 9 and 23, and I'll get into that here in a minute. So here's the question. How do we get more faith so that we can please God? Good question. I'm glad I asked. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What am I doing now? I am preaching and teaching God's word. The more you hear God's word, the more you trust and believe in God's word. And the more he will reward you and that increases your faith. Faith is doing things that you can't see happening. Amen. Does that, you understand? That's faith. And faith is listening and talking to him and doing what he's telling you to do. Not what the world is saying. Not what your heart is saying. But what he is telling you to do. Amen. Your faith will increase by being profitable. And doing more than what is expected of you. I've never heard that before. Well, you need to. Because this comes from Luke 17, 5 through 10. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. If the Lord was here right now, that would be a good question for all of us. Or, or a, a, an asking, God, would you increase our faith? But the answer is really... <laughs> It doesn't look like it, it relates to anything. This is, goes outside of our way of thinking. So listen to what he said. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sesame tree, sesame tree be thou plucked up by the roots and, and be thou planted into the sea and it should obey you. But which of you, so here is how it works, listen to it. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet? Verse 8. And will not rather say to him, make ready therewith, I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drinking and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. You understand what it's saying? You don't come in, you bring them in, you say, feed yourself. No, no, if he's your servant, you're supposed to come in, get my food and everything else. That's what I pay you for. Got it? Don't think. Don't think. That servant, uh, because, uh, don't thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him. I thought not. Unprofitable servants, or likewise, when you have done all these things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Amen. Now, I hope I got that all right. 
So here's the thing. If you're just doing what you're expected to do, you're unprofitable. And he says that's how you increase your faith. What are we talking about? Do more than what's expected of you. Right? Do more. It's not enough just to come to church. It's not enough to, uh, to be nice and good. You need to do more. Uh, wait a minute. Is there another scripture that goes along with it? Yeah. Jesus Christ said this. Matthew 5.41. If someone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. Go beyond what is expected of you. That makes you profitable. When I used to work, <laughs> maybe I should stop there. No. <laughs> when I used to work in a secular job, I was one of those who would stay on the job till it was done, right? When 5 o'clock would come along and I wasn't done, I would go the extra mile and stay with it. And my employers saw that. And when it came time when things got tight and they had to let people go, guess who was valuable and profitable to them? The person that went the second mile. The person that did more than what was expected of. You understand what I'm saying? That increased their faith in me and their reward in me. God is the same thing, and that's what he's saying. You want your faith to grow. Do more than what is expected of you. You would think that's a duh. Well, if that's a duh, why aren't we doing it? The boy's quiet in here. Guys, I'm saying all this so that we can get better favor with God. So that God can trust us. So that we would have more faith. That we can make a difference in other people's lives. Because you can't help not helping someone and not feeling the benefits of helping somebody. I'm telling you, it's the greatest feeling in the world. One of the greatest feelings in the world. That's part of the blessings of being a Christian. And part of the things that people look at in our lives, in our attitudes. We talked about Beatitudes. They look at that. That makes a difference in their life. There's other scriptures, but I'm just not going to take time to go, with, go and doing, uh, I'm going into that kind of detail. Why do we Christians have impure faith? Because faith is deluded by unbelief think that one through now here's what's crazy did you know you can have both at the same time you can have faith and unbelief really is there scripture for that <laughs> yes there is this is Matthew 17, 14 through uh, 17. King James Version, I'm going to stay with this. This describes a situation that Christ walked into with his uh, disciples, all right? So I'll, I'll just read it to you. And when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Now look at it. They couldn't do it. And, and the question comes to my mind because I see myself as a disciple of Christ, don't you? And yet there's times when I need to be doing something and it didn't work. Right? Right? Ever experienced that? Well, the disciples were experiencing this. And I brought him to the disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless, ouch, that hurt, and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. God, are you suffering because of my in pure faith, I have faith, but I want pure faith. Small faith, even the size of a mustard seed. Pure faith can move mountains, right? So how do I get pure faith? And that's a question that we as Christians should be asking. Is there an answer to that? Yes. In Mark, 
Same situation is the same story. He just adds this to it. Jesus said to them, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. I love this answer. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Can you identify being realistic. God, I want to believe. I want to trust you. But I've got this unbelief that's inside of me. I don't know how to get rid of it. Lord, help my unbelief. That's what this whole scenario is about. This whole story. And it's not a story. It's a true thing. It happened. It's about unbelief. Something that all of us Christians face constantly. Don't you? And if you don't, you're lying to yourself. To some degree, we do. All right. Go back to Matthew. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? God, why is our faith not working? Look at what he said. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall re be removed, and nothing shall be impossible you, uh, unto you. So what is he talking about? Unbelief. Look at the next verse. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So this morning I want to talk about how to get rid of unbelief. Is there anybody in here that doesn't wrestle with unbelief? All of you don't wrestle with unbelief? I guess you should be teaching me because I wrestle with it. You, Pastor? Yeah, I do. Well, because i got a devil. It's all the time talking and talking and talking and talking. Is he? Yeah, yeah. So if you're not dealing with unbelief, why aren't you moving mountains? Ooh, that white shining a light of truth. Now, I'm not getting down on us. I'm just saying we need to understand how to get closer to God, to have a closer faith. And this is what we should be doing. And if we're not doing it, then the result is we're having more and more problems with unbelief. That's just common sense, right? Do you see? I hope you guys love me. Because I want you to know that God wants you to have pure faith, including your pastor. And we're seeing more and more things happening the purer our faith gets. All right? And, of course, you got to do things, but... That's not what we're talking about. So let, let me be honest with you. Unbelief goes out by prayer and fasting. Now, most interpret the words this, time, this kind, they think that's meaning devils. And it may be. I won't argue with that one. But the teaching is not about casting out devils. It is about faith and unbelief. It is the subject throughout the whole event. If unbelief is a substance that dilutes faith, then it must be dealt with. And the best way to deal with it is by fasting and prayer. Oh, I don't feel comfortable with fasting because that really hurts. That takes commitment. That takes doing the extra mile. That takes... Uh, 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 and, and you wonder why God's not happy with a lot of things that happen in our lives. We're not pleasing him because he wants pure faith. Boy, you're quiet. I'm hoping you're thinking you're getting this through. Fasting and prayer is a great path to great faith because it destroys unbelief. Now, I'm not talking about whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Because God is merciful, and if your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, 
you got it made. What I'm talking about is getting closer to God so he's got... Uh, so that you have more faith in him to move mountains, to make a difference in other people's life. I don't just want to do what's required of me. I want to do more than what's required of me. That is where faith comes into. Isn't that what we just read? That's something we need to understand. I want to go that second mile. Amen. I say I want to, but my actions... Speak a lot louder than my words, right? I want my actions to match what I'm saying. Amen. And that takes discipline. Amen. Does faith and unbelief mix? No more than pure water and salt water mix. You see, unbelief pollutes faith. Just as salt water pollutes pure water. Can you have great faith with polluted belief? Good question. So here's how you help get rid of unbelief. Ezekiel 47, 8. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. This is a future event. The waters of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea pure. In other words, the more that you get into God's Word, the more you listen to it, the more you use faith, it begins to dilute that salt water. It begins to dilute unbelief. Does that make sense? The more I spend time in hearing His Word, the more time I spend in prayer and in fasting, the more unbelief gets diluted. Think about it. It's that simple. So fasting and prayer increases faith and drives out unbelief. Well, how do we fast and how do we pray? Good question. Prayer is easy, but fasting is hard. Is that true? Uh -huh. If you do it right, <laughs> it sure is. That's why a lot of Christians don't do that. Boy, we're good at praying. And thank God, Lisa, for the prayer chain that's starting. That is really cool. If you guys don't know about that, sign up in the back. Uh, when a prayer request comes and, and you send it to her, she emails that out to all of us. Now, you're not supposed to answer it. It's just to bring you up with what's going on, and you can pray at that point. I think that's important. But prayer without fasting, although prayer accomplishes us a lot, but, man, when you stick a fast on it, there's something different. How many have experienced that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, why are you counting people? Because I want you to understand we need God's power in our lives. We need to make him proud of us. We need to be effective in his kingdom. Fasting and prayer is like soap and water when it comes to cleaning up your unbelief. And I believe it takes both of them. All right? So if you've got the prayer down, work on the fasting part. All right? Now, if we're talking about prayer, let me give you some basic prayer things, basic parts, right? Identifying God when you pray, you should say this, creator of the universe. I like to put that in there. God of Israel, I like to put that in there. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my father, my God, my redeemer. My God in heaven, and so forth. I like to start my serious prayers identifying him. Who is he? Right? Then the next thing, I like to thank him, especially for entrusting you with your problems and trials, knowing you will grow and learn from them. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we walked in Sunday morning and the whole church was flooded. 
Really, Pastor? Uh huh. Especially looking from this point going back the other direction, right? Thank you, Lord, for the problems I ran into. Thank you for the flat tire I had yesterday. Thank you for uh, the person that really hated my guts and, and just, you know, you, you see what I'm saying? Why do you thank him? Because all things work together for the good and he's got control, right? So, and this is just basic prayer. Then make your request known. Ask anything. God, would you provide me with the things I need today? You know, paycheck would help. You know what I'm saying? Ask them. Don't complain to them. That was the problems that the disciples had when they were in the storm. The water was flash going everywhere. It looked like they were sinking. Christ was sound asleep at the bow of the boat. And instead of going to them and say, Jesus, we got a problem. You want to look into this? Would you do something about this? Instead, they said, Don't you care? We're fixing to drown. They were complaining to him. I don't want to complain to God. I just want to be very specific. Father, you see the need. Would you do this? And he already knows that you have the need before you do it. But there's something about asking that he wants. That's easy. That's prayer. Right? Okay. Make your requests. Know anything. And then submit to his will and not to your own. Whatever he tells you to do, do that. Have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. Follow the peace. And that peace that we're talking about in your heart, we've talked about this for a long time. We will until the Lord comes back. That peace is when your will lines with his will. Follow that peace. That should be part of your prayer. Submit to his will, not your own. Why? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is just some basic points in prayer. So we got prayer out of the way. Well, what about fasting? Now, here's some of the basic about fasting. Fasting is initially denying the flesh in order to set yourself apart for God. Amen. That's a basic. Okay? Fasting is a spiritual discipline. A lot of us aren't disciplined. If you start fasting, you learn what discipline is, right? That's, when you're hungry, your body is screaming out, right? And, and, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Your favorite candy bar is a snicker. You're going to find that in the vending machine that was never there before, right? Is that true? It was with me. You know, the devil don't want you fasting. Why? Because when you're fasting, your mind is on, oh, man, I'm hurting. Why am I hurting? God, I just, God, help me here. God, help me with this. And you're, you find yourself in a prayerful attitude talking to God. Do you not? Yeah. Those of you who have fasted in the past, you know what I'm talking about. It's a constant reminder while you're there and you're getting close to God. Right? You can't help it. All right. You should have nothing that contains nutrients. That's basic. Okay? A fast can last from one meal up to 40 days. Right? Really? That's pretty broad. Yeah, it is. So let's, let's talk a little bit about a 24-hour fast. By fasting, well, what that means is you just fast from uh, dinner one day to the dinner the next day. This amounts to a 24-hour fast, right? For example, if you finish dinner at 7 p.m. Monday, don't eat until dinner at 7 p.m. the next day. And you've completed a full 24-hour fast. Well, that's a duh. Well, I'm, I'm afraid sometimes you have to mention that, right? All right? Um, again, a fast can be from one meal, and it just depends on what you feel that God wants you to do. There's nothing wrong with just fasting one meal. That one meal, you're going to find, man, <sighs> you know what I'm talking about? And you're talking to God. But sometimes... 
you really need to get his attention. Is this how you get his attention? I don't know if that's how you get his attention. All I know is it works. Because it's like putting an amplifier to your prayer. That's my way of seeing it. Is this making sense? You want to get rid of unbelief? Fast often. The Pharisees fasted twice a week. And Christ says that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. Go beyond that. Now, you can't go on a two-month fast or a one-month fast twice a week. That ain't going to happen. But at least, guys, start this way. Start light. Just fast a meal. Do it once a week. And eventually get where you're doing it twice a week. Well, that sounds like a routine. Shouldn't prayer be a routine? Amen. Am I telling you the truth? You want to get closer? You want to get rid of unbelief? Do what I'm talking about. This is God's way of doing it. Again, I'm not saying you're going to heaven or hell whether you do it or not doing it. I'm talking about getting closer to God where you are making a difference in this world. And we need more Christians making a difference in this world by doing things according to God's way. And how do you do that? By fasting and prayer. That means talking to Him one-on-one and listening to His Spirit. Because in a fast, you are listening. All right? Matthew 6, 16 through 18. When you fast, Christ, this is his rules. I'm not going to argue with it. Don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and uh, devilish to... uh, to, so people will admire them for fasting. I tell you the truth, that, it, uh, that is the only reward they'll ever get. So when you fast, don't let anybody know. Kathy, you never know when I fast, do you? She has no clue, right? It's between me and God. I don't want her to know, right? Because what is done in secret, God rewards you openly. You follow me? Okay, now there are times when I do tell her, you know, I made these, your favorite cookies. Well, babe, I, I, you know, I like those, you know. Uh, but then why aren't you eating them? And I, well, you know, I'm fasting, right? But I don't do that for her to be impressed that I'm fasting. You follow what I'm saying? All right. Now, I'm also going to say this too. This isn't part of my notes. But how many of you know that I'm diabetic? Some of you do. Well, what does that mean? It's not an excuse for me not to fast. But I will tell you this, that if I'm fasting and my sugar level drops below 60, it's time to stop the fast. Really? That's not faith? (laughs) Guys, you've got to use some common sense here, right? God knows your heart. So what I'll usually do is take a little bit to get the sugar level back up, right? And sometimes I'll quit the fast, or sometimes God will say, okay, that's taken care of. Keep on going the rest of the time. How do I know that's right? Because I'm hungry. You know what I'm saying? God is not stupid. Understand that he knows you, he loves you, he sees your heart, he knows your way of thinking, he knows your attitude, he knows what you're doing. He also knows that you got a devil that's trying to trip you up and doing all these other things. And God has, I mean, Christ walked on this planet to, to understand and go through the things that we suffered. So he understands what's going on. I'm not trying to pull the wool over his eyes, I'm just being honest. God, what do you want me to do? Am I making sense? The whole point is my world and your world should circle around his world. Right? And listen to him. Okay? I'm talking about fasting. All right? So this is what it says. When you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and... uh, uh, Is that the word devilish? Devilish? Dishevel, huh? Dishevel. 
I don't know if that's an English word that's used anymore anymore. So that's why it kind of threw me a little bit. So people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, so no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you openly. Right? He wants to reward. And that's a promise. What will he reward you with? Most of the time, it's what you're asking for. Amen. That's what it says, right? You guys have heard me talk about this one time. Sometimes you, 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 you don't use fasting to twist God's arm. I tried that one time. I've talked about this in the past. I think it's worth me mentioning it once again. I was on a fast. I was going about a week long. The reason why is because we didn't have a job. I needed a job. So I'm fasting. God, give me a job. God, give me a job. Right? Uh, I've got two kids. I've got a wife. And I've got no income. God, I need a job. So I'm fasting. Right? On a Friday night, I get a phone call from an outfit and said, we need you. Can you come in Monday morning and we got a job for you? One of our guys is quitting. Thank you, Lord. Kathy made no-bake cookies. I pigged out, got sick. It was great, right? Fast was over. Saturday evening. Don't bother coming in, Jerry, Monday, because the guy changed his mind. He's still working for us. I don't have a job for you. Hey, God, I was fasting. And he said, I know you were. I didn't tell you to. The only way I could get you to stop is to make you think you had another job coming. So what I'm saying is, guys, you don't twist God's arm. You go before him and talk to him and work things out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, I'm just trying to keep us in reality here, all right? Now, Jesus, this is from uh, uh, Luke uh, 14, uh, Luke 4, 1 through 2, right? Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. God led him, right? God, should I be fasting over this, right? And if he says yes, you go, oh, great. No. <laughs> well, I'm just being honest, right? Really? He says, yeah, really. Okay. How long should I fast? He'll tell you, right? I'm not twisting his arm. I'm just being realistic. Some of you ask me, how do you fast? I'm answering you as best as I know from experience and from Scripture. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being 40 days tempted the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And when uh, they were ended, he afterwards were hungry. I mean, after 40 days, you're hungry. Right Now, nothing was said about water, drinking water, not drinking water. There are a couple of uh, instances in the Bible where God did a miracle and they didn't use water. But that is a miracle thing because you'll find that the human body can't go 40 days without water. Okay? So, uh, basically what I'm saying is when you fast, you better drink some water. All right? It's the nutrition and stuff like that. I'm just giving it to you. Does this help? Give you a little bit of understanding. All right. So uh, then, uh, I mean, that was Christ. Now, Daniel's fast. Here's, here's another one. In Daniel's fast, you eat only something sown like vegetables and water only. No sweeteners, no bread, meat, eggs, or dairy, uh, dietary products. And, and the, the, the great thing about a Daniel fast is that you're not limited to any specific amount of food, but rather to the kinds of food that you can eat. Is that really a fast? was with Daniel, right? So that's one way of fasting. Are you seeing? There are no set rules. But God, you got to be honest with him because he knows when you're cheating. Okay? All right. All right. It involves the Daniel fast... Uh, involves a 10 to 21 day period devo uh, devo devoted depriving, your depriving yourself 
of animal products, preservatives, uh, and it is exclusive of fruits, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, that kind of stuff. So if you want to do an annual fast, that's fine. All right. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, Where does that come from? This is Daniel 1 uh, and 12. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. You can look that up if you want to. Um, Daniel 10, uh, 2 through 3 says, And in those days I, Daniel, was mourning uh, three full weeks. He was fasting for three full weeks, all right? I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine to my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till the whole three weeks. Now, I would say this, Daniel was a real stinker when it came to fasting. Three weeks without a bath, Okay, I'm not going to say any more because it's going to. Now I'm not going to go there. All right, at least put deodorant on. <laughs> okay, is that how we should do? All of us should do this kind of fast. No, there's different. Whatever God leads you to do. All right. There are many kinds of fast. Bottom line is you deprive yourself of something that you, that you need or really enjoy or something that is meaningful for a time. God knows the, your purpose and your honest heart. So food is one thing you can fast from. Physical intimacy, even that's in Scripture. And, and Paul said, don't do that forever. You better have a time when you get back together. But that's one way. Uh, some people fasting television, uh, fasting video games, or cell phones, or social media, or coffee. Does all that count? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, this is one way we know that pleases God. And this is how we know that He rewards us with His favor. So, that's just kind of covering fasting. You say, well, this was an inspirational. This doesn't send cold chills down my back. Well, no, sometimes we got to get a teaching inside of us so that we can be more effective in God's kingdom. Does that make sense? I hope you love me a little bit more. I really love you guys, right? But I want us to be as first assembly of God and Norman effective and making a difference in the world that's around us. We cannot do that on our own. We need to get rid of this unbelief that's inside of us. And all of us have it. Unbelief is, is dirt, right? And if you're in dirt a lot, which we are in this world, you got to keep washing it off, right? And this is a good way of washing it off by prayer and fasting. Well, I'm not there yet. And, and I don't suggest you start your first fast going on a 40-day fast. If you were like me, three days is about as long as you could go on your first time through. It's it just not, you know. But start slow. And as you do it, faith begins to grow. Because you'll understand what we're talking about, the relationship. You get to talking where you're hearing his voice. And when you're hearing his voice in a fast, then you can have faith in that voice that you're hearing. And you start doing that. And when you do that, your faith begins to grow. You see how that works? And when your faith begins to grow, your doubt begins to fall apart. You see what I'm saying? That's all we're talking about. And those of you that are on Facebook, I hope this helps. And I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, because I want to show the rest of the congregation a, uh, a little skit that the skit guys do. And uh, you say, oh, I wish I could see that. You should have been here. All right? I'm being honest with you. Guys, you have no excuse not to be here. You need to be honoring God with being in his house. That honors God. And you go, well, why does God not honor me? Well, isn't that a two-way street? Should be, right? Oh, you're talking about a discipline. Well, if I'm talking about a discipline of being here on a Sunday morning, then I've wasted my time with teaching you about fasting and prayer because you're not going to do it. You've got to honor God, right? And again, it's not about salvation. 
It's about being effective in God's kingdom. I want to be effective in His kingdom, right? So take this to heart and uh, uh, use it on Facebook. Have a great day.